Friends, I want to read the word of God. Shall we stand? While we are standing, just an update in terms of Vision 2040. And today I just want to announce that last Sunday we were at 23%. This Sunday we are at 24%. Hallelujah. We've gone 1% beyond. We have raised total cash and pledges by yesterday, 36,024,698. Amen. And thank you for supporting. Thank you for giving. Uh, the envelopes are there. The pledge cards are there. Let's keep running this race because we shall hit the mark. We're reading Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 to 13. Wonderful scripture. The Bible says this. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today. The Lord your God will set you high. The Lord your God will set you high. The Lord your God will set you high. Above all the nations on earth, all these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God, you will be blessed in the city and blessed <coughs> in the countryside. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the cows of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in. And blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your bands and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on earth, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him, then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. I'm saying the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. Amen. In the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground, in the land he sowed to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season, and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head. The Lord will make you the head. Amen. Not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be. You will always be. Uh, you will always be at the top. Never at the bottom. This is the Lord's word to you, to me, to us. And God's people say it. Amen. We may be seated. God bless you so much. We want to thank God for those uh, listening to us on Kubamba Radio. And we thank God because this message is going far and wide. Those, those watching us online, we welcome you. Uh, those in the sanctuary, those in the pavilion, those in the parents' room, wherever you are, we welcome you today to hear God's word. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you because there is no God like you. We thank you because of the joy of hearing your word. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And dear Lord, what a privilege even for me to be able to stand before your people and to share your word. Now, Holy Spirit, anoint your servant as he shares this word today. Father God, for every heart 
that listens and receives this word. May there be an overflow. May there be a divine overflow. Father, we say thank you because it's going to happen starting now. We give you all the glory and all the praise. And all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the things that blesses my heart is to be able to stand before God's people and share his word. One of the amazing things about the word of God, it is transformational. You know, sometimes when people just stand and give speeches, speeches are speeches, they come and go. But when somebody comes to declare the word of God, that word goes and it is sent by the Holy Spirit and it begins to create transformation. It begins to bring change. Sometimes it blows my mind when I hear some of the testimonies that come after people have heard the word of God. Because let me tell you this, the transformation is not because of Pastor Ambrose. The transformation because of God himself. The Bible says, the word I speak to you, this word is spirit and it is life. It does something in your life. It takes you from position A to position B to take you to position C. It moves you. It does amazing things in your life. And this afternoon, as you believe and hear God's word, I'm telling you, God is going to shift your situation. I'm saying God is going to shift your situation. God is amazing. So all I have to do is open my mouth and speak. But God takes over and he begins to do things that I myself cannot understand. But I want to thank God. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, last week, I had a bad flu. But thank God, it passed over the bar. Hallelujah. I'm saying it went over the bar. Hallelujah. I'm well, and I thank God that we can share the word of God today. This month, we are talking about the divine overflow. Hallelujah. Divine overflow. And one of the things I want to let you know is that God desires to flood your life. I'm saying God desires to flood your life. He loves it. He loves to lavish a lot of things into your life. That is why when Jesus came, Jesus said, I came that you may have life. And then he said, have it more abundantly. God is a God of, he, he, he desires to lavish his love on, your, on you. He wants to bless you bigger than you can even imagine. And this month, as we believe about God's overflow, I believe this overflow is going to reach out to you. I'm saying this overflow is going to come to you. The devil is crazy. The devil, on, on the other hand, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil likes to take away from you. The devil likes to stop things from coming to you. But God wants it to come to you. God wants to bless you. God wants to take you to the next level. And that is why when the Lord made Adam, this is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It's an amazing statement that God made. This is what he said. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over. Uh, it is over, 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 overflow. Hallelujah. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God desires to overflow your life. And so when he had walked with the children of Israel for some time, and that's a passage we read in Deuteronomy, where God again reiterates to them the blessing. And he says in Deuteronomy 28, which we read earlier, if I can read verse 1, and 2, and 3, so that you can see what we're talking about. He says, if you fully obey the Lord your God, and carefully follow all his commands I give you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. Then he says, all these blessings, all of them will do what? Will come on you and accompany you. God loves to bless. And so today when we talk about the divine overflow actualized, I just want to assure you, that this month of July, the seventh month of the year, that God is going to complete that which he purposed in your life in this month. 
I'm saying God is going to accomplish what he has purposed in your life. God is not a man that he should lie. He's not a son of man that he should change his, his mind. God loves you. Now, the funny thing about our lives is that we have been conditioned to think that God really doesn't like us. And sometimes, even the messages we hear in church, they condition us to tell us that we really have to struggle to be pleasing to God. We really have to try our best to make even God <clears throat> turn his face to us. We really have to work hard. We really have to do it. And if we don't really work hard, God will not come our way. Let me tell you this. God is not asking you to come to him. God has come your way. Hallelujah. God has come your way. You don't have to struggle so much. Of course, we were conditioned right from class one. Work hard. Hello. Do your homework. When you do your homework, mommy will buy you ice cream. Hello. Do this. Do that. Of course, there are conditions in life. Of course, there are things that God would like us to do. But let me tell you this. For God to love you, he doesn't need for you to do anything. Uh, let me say that again. For God to love you, you don't have to do anything. Just open your heart. Let him come your way. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. He did something. He gave his only begotten son. He did something. Four things that will summarize some of the things I want to say today. And just show you the love of God for us. The divine overflow actualized. Four things. Number one, there is the promise. And then there is the prayer. And then there is the provision. And then there is the praise. The promise, the prayer, the provision, and the praise. How does God overflow in your life? Let me start with the promise. God is a God of promises. And when God promises us, He basically releases our inheritance in our lives through promise, through the word He speaks to us. Tell your neighbor you have an inheritance. Uh, tell the other neighbor you have an inheritance. Now tell, him, tell them now, I have an inheritance. Now, you see, that sounded much stronger. So, <laughs> say it one more time. I have an inheritance. You know, this thing of inheritances can sometimes be a challenge. And especially when children know that their parents have capacity to leave for them a very big inheritance. And so, you find sometimes the children begin to juggle and find ways where they can be pleasing to their parents. Especially when their parents begin to become much older and are reaching the stage of going to the other world. Hello? They position themselves. Ah, uh, They tell themselves, hey, I better be good to dad. I better be good to mom. You know, so that when they die, I will get this and I will get that. Let me tell you this. When Jesus died, he actually had you in mind because he knew that he was going to give you his entire inheritance. Hallelujah. We, ha we are inheritors. And God has given us much, so much to inherit. And he did that through promise. And one of the ways he did that, as he began to prepare us to understand the inheritance, he started with Abraham. He used three generations. Number one, he used Abraham. Then he used Isaac. Then he used Jacob. And he kept telling them, I will give you this. I've given you this. And when he was doing that, he was not only preparing us, or preparing the Jews. He was also preparing us, the Gentiles, who would get to hear about Jesus through the Jews. So he said, I'm promising Abraham. I'm promising Isaac. I'm promising Jacob. And I want to show you that God is a promise keeper. I'm saying God is a promise keeper. Now, see what he said to Abraham. I'll just be picking one or two things, and then I'll come to Jesus. He says this in Genesis chapter 12. Now, he's giving a promise, and he's declaring and saying, I will do this. He says this in Genesis 12, 1. 
the Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Then he says, I will make you great. Now you can imagine, he's saying all these things, and Abraham hasn't done anything. Abraham did not prove himself to be given this inheritance. God just picked him out, and God decided to bless him. Let me tell you this, God has decided to pick you out and to bless you. He says, I will make you into a great nation. I'm the one who will make you. Don't try to make yourself. I will make you into a great nation. And then he says, I will bless you. And then he says, I will make your name great. And then he says, and you will be a blessing. Can you imagine that? He says, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples, now remember people is in plural, all peoples on earth. In other words, everybody else who is not a Jew will be blessed through you. So God made a promise, <clears throat> an inheritance. So that is Abraham. Now Isaac. In the Bible, Genesis 26, God is talking to Isaac. This is what he says. Of course, Isaac was experiencing a famine. Now, you may be experiencing a famine right now, but you have an inheritance. So, God is talking to Isaac, and this is what he says. Now, there was a famine in the land beside the previous famine in Abraham's time. <clears throat> and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerah. And the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you. And will bless you. Now, remember again, he's talking about to Isaac. And then he says, for, for to you and your descendants, I will do what? I will give all these lands. And will confirm the oath I saw to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. That's the next generation. He's spoken to Abraham, I'll bless you. He said to Isaac, I'll bless you. Now to Jacob, this is what the Bible says in Genesis 35. Jacob has just come back. He has gone to the land of Bethel. He's gone back to that, to that place. And then the Bible says, then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there. The word Bethel means the house of the house of God. Bethel, the house of God. Go up to Bethel <clears throat> and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress, <clears throat> and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in, in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak of Shechem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them, so that no one pursued them. Or go back to that verse. Somebody maybe needs that verse. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell on the towns, all around them, so that no one pursued them. Let me tell you, if there's somebody stalking you in Jesus' name, let me tell you this, God is going to put terror in their lives. Amen. Hallelujah. God is going to watch over you. God is not going to abandon you. You are special to Him. Hallelujah. Your business is not going down into the ground. It doesn't matter who has his business next to you. <clears throat> God is going to lift you up. God is going to watch over you because there's a covenant between him and yourself. The Bible says in verse 5, Then they set out, and the terror of God, then they set out, and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them, so that no one pursued them. Verse 6, Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Of course, you need to remember when Jacob was running, uh, he reached a place which is actually Bethel. He was so tired, he lay down, put a stone, and he slept. 
And the Bible says he had a dream. You remember that story? And he saw a staircase going up to heaven. And God was at the top of the staircase. And God said to him, you know, he saw angels ascending and descending. And God says, where you are putting your head on, I've given you that land. It's an inheritance. Let me tell you this. There are things God has already decided to give you without you performing anything. You have not done anything. anything. God loves you. God created his love. God created you in his love and he has given you an inheritance. So you don't have to strive. Look at your neighbor one more time and tell them, don't strive. Hallelujah. Now fast forward to the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 1. Come Jesus and Jesus says this, say this about Jesus. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 3 because you know this verse. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has done what? Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Look at verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Then it says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Let me read verse 6 in the Amplified Version. Verse 6 in the Amplified Version says, So that we might be to the praise and the commendation of his glorious grace, favor. Okay, just go back. So that we might be to the praise and the commendation of his glorious grace, favor <clears throat> and mercy, which he so freely bestowed on us in who? In the beloved. Let me tell you this. You have an inheritance. You have an inheritance. Now, some of you may be saying, which one? Now, it may not be land. It may not be a block in town. But it is peace that passes all understanding. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says in John 14, 27, Peace I give to you. My peace I leave to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. We have an inheritance. We have an inheritance because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have an inheritance because we can now come to God and ask him for anything, and he'll give it to us. Let me tell you this. God doesn't just care about giving you joy, giving you love, giving you peace. He's also said he wants to give you material things. Hallelujah. He wants you to give you health. He wants to give you clothing. The Bible says in the, in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. These are verses you know very well. Because sometimes we get disturbed about the physical things. Listen to what the Bible says. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not so much, so much more valuable than they? Can, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more, much more overflow, much more, much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? The Bible says, for the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his. And all these things will be given to you as well. God cares about your wedding plans. Uh, let me talk to the people on this side. I'm saying God cares about your wedding plans. 
He cares about the fact that you have not hit the budget yet. Hello? So don't worry. He cares about your wedding. Now, what, what tells me that? Because there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Hallelujah. Can you imagine God putting stories of weddings in the Bible? Because he cares about issues of weddings in the Bible because there are things that you deal with all the time. So let me read that portion, Kidogo, so that somebody may be encouraged. Thank you, Jesus. John chapter 2. Uh, God cares about these issues of life. He says, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Thank God for mothers. Hallelujah. She was the, she was the matron. Thank God for mothers. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, Hey, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Now, that is important to the brim. It's important because there are some people who cannot drink tea that has not reached the brim. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. They were carrying water and they took it. And the master of the banquet tested the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Ladies and gentlemen, your wine may have run out since January. Let me tell you this seventh month, God has saved the best for you. In Jesus' name. Something good is about to happen in your life. You see, God cares about these Normal things of life. He says, I am in your, your inheritance. I am I, I'm what you need. If you come to me, I'm what you need. That is John chapter 2. By the way, John chapter 3, he met Nicodemus who had a spiritual challenge. And God showed him the way. In chapter 4, Jesus meets the Samaritan woman who had an issue with her family, with her husband, the six husbands. And Jesus said, I'm the seventh husband. Normal things of life. In chapter 5 of John, Jesus meets this man who had been unwell for 38 years, dealing with a chronic problem. Let me tell you this, God cares about your chronic issues. And Jesus told that man, stand up, pick up your bed and go home. In John chapter 6, Jesus met a crowd of people who were listening to him for three days and they had not eaten. And Jesus said, feed these people. Jesus cares about feeding issues. Your food budget. He cares about your food budget. Chapter 7, Jesus talks about, I am the water of life. No more things. Chapter 8, Jesus meets a woman who was caught in adultery, in the act of adultery, and she's about to be accused, but her, the, the core accused is not there. An issue of injustice. Let me tell you this. God handles issues of injustice in your life. And I want to tell you that Jesus will come through for you in Jesus' name. Jesus bends down. He starts writing. And th these guys are carrying stones ready, ready to hand out over justice. And I don't know what this woman was saying while she was down there. She said, God, you better come through for me. Yes, I've done the wrong thing, but you better do something. And guess what? Jesus is writing. And, you know, I believe, I know what he wrote. He just wrote the name of the co-accused because he was standing out there. Uh, he used his, his middle name. And I'm telling you, one by one, these guys took off. Let me tell you this. You may have been accused wrongly, but God is coming through for you. Chapter 9, Jesus meets a guy who had been born blind from birth. Things that happened and the disciples came. Who did wrong? Is this the parents or is it this guy who sinned? And Jesus needs to handle that issue. Jesus is saying, this is not a matter of inheritance. This is not a matter of generational curse. This is so that God may be, show himself mighty on behalf of this man. He put spit on the ground, 
put some mud, put it in this guy's eyes, told this guy, go and wash. He went and washed. He came back saying. Let me tell you this. Jesus cares about every situation in your life. No wonder in John chapter 10, he comes and says, you know, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. In chapter 11, Jesus is dealing with issues of death, which we face all the time. Lazarus is sick. Lazarus dies. Jesus shows up and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So let me tell you this. Do not disconnect Sunday from Monday. Let me say it one more time. Do not disconnect Sunday from Monday. God who was with you today is going to walk into your Monday, into your Tuesday, into your Wednesday, into your Thursday, into your Friday, into your Saturday. And Sunday you're coming back with a testimony. In Jesus' name. So, in all this, what I'm trying to tell you this is this, that Jesus is your inheritance. But then there's a, pro, there's a prayer. So let me deal with this prayer, which is very important. The prayer. We are in a season of praying. We want to pray for revival. We want to pray for the nations. We want to pray for Africa and for the world. The prayer. Tell your neighbor the prayer. This is a very important prayer. This is called the prayer, which is your demand. And I'll explain it to Kidogo so that you can understand it and so that you pray. One of the challenges that we have today is that prayer has been made very difficult. And I keep telling people, don't, don't, be, don't, be, don't, be, don't make prayer too hard. Prayer is easy. Hallelujah. Prayer is easy. But there's a kind of prayer that puts a demand on God's promises. That's what I want to talk about. A prayer that puts a demand. It's not a prayer that is just asking out of the blues. It's a prayer when you put a demand, you're putting a demand on a promise that has been made. Hallelujah. Let me read this verse. Luke chapter 11, verse 5 to 13. A very interesting story here, but it will explain what I'm, I'm trying to share today. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend. Now I want you to underline the word friend. Hallelujah. Now, I know you're not sitting next to your friend, so look, you just look around. <clears throat> Look at your neighbor. Of course, I know you are, some of you are actually sitting next to your friend. Uh, maybe it's a mother, daughter, husband, wife. I hope the husband is sitting next to the wife, not your ex. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Somebody saying, Ambrose, don't go there, don't go there. But I want you to understand this issue of friend. <clears throat> because God is saying, when it comes to issues of prayer, think friendship. Amen? The Bible says, Jesus said, I, have not, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. There's a way you can put a demand on a friend that you cannot put even on your relative. True? Your relatives will give you a hard time. They said, but you were here yesterday. Hmm? You, you have just been doing things. Oh, we are not, uh, we're not engaging. But there's something about a friend that you can, uh, without shame, hello, come to a friend and put out demand. Hallelujah. He said, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight. Now, first of all, that is the wrong time. Hello. Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves. Now that is specific. There are many. There are three. Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey. Again, there's another friend. Hello? So you have two friends. So there's this friend. There's this one who has just showed up at the wrong time. Hello? <laughs> and you are not prepared, and so you, you need something, because this is a friend you have to entertain. You go to another friend at midnight. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. Keep going. And suppose the one inside answers, now remember the one inside is who? His friend. 
And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. And my children and I are in bed. I can't. Now he says the word can't. Not I won't. I can't get up and give you anything. Not even one loaf. Anything. Verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread, because of what? Of friendship. Yet because of your shameless audacity. Uh, that is called putting a demand on the friendship. Shameless what? Audacity. He will surely get up and give you, not just the three loaves you asked, as much as you need, so that you don't come. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> now, who is sharing this story? It is Jesus. Jesus is telling you, let me give you a secret about my father. He is your friend. And if you come to him and put a demand on his friendship, I'm telling you, no matter what he's doing on this planet, he will show up for you. He will come through for you. And that's why Jesus now gives now the application of that story. So I say to you, ask and shall be given. Now let me read that in the Amplified Version because it opens it up, up, up a kidogo. It says this, in the Amplified Version, verse 9. So I say to you, ask and do what? Keep on asking. You see, can you imagine the friend is knocking at the door? Ka, 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 ka. The guy is saying, hey, nini, nini. Ka, 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 ka. Yes, tell me, what is it? Ka, 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 ka. Yes, I've heard. What is it? Mazebana, give me some bread. I need some bread. A friend of mine, the guy says, Ama, I cannot come. Bana. Why did you come today? Ah, but you should have come in the morning. Ka, 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 ka. Wake up. Hmm? And he's just shamelessly with this audacity saying, but you're my friend. You're my friend. You're my friend. And I know you have what I need. Let me tell you this. So ask and keep on asking. And it shall be given you. Then he says, seek. And keep on seeking. And you shall find. The seeking part is asking God for wisdom. God what is the solution here? You know, you're, you're, just, you're just talking to God. You're seeking for this. You're seeking for a solution. Seeking for a solution. Putting a demand. Let me tell you this. You can actually put a demand on your excellent spirit. Let me tell you this. There's nobody stupid in this house. All of you are smart people. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, you, you, you did not know, but I'm very intelligent. I'm just giving you that information so you know that you're not sitting next to a foolish person. Tell, tell your neighbor, I am very intelligent. Tell them I have an excellent spirit on me. You know, when you begin to realize that, you can begin to put a demand on your excellence. And it will show up. Something will rise up. Seek and keep on seeking and you shall find. I remember the days we used to do exams. Sometimes, you, the moment you open the first page and you write your name, sometimes you'd forget your name, but you write your name and you're so tense, you look at question number one, you can't answer. It's too hard. Then you go to question number two, you didn't study that one. Then you go to question number three, you're blank. That is the time when you see students all turn their heads to the ceiling as if God is going to leak the exams. But then you go to number four, and that one you studied. In fact, you begin to start answering that one. But as you, as you start answering that one, you're answering it, and you're just writing and writing, suddenly the juices in your system, the intelligence in your heart, in your mind begins to rise up. You begin to get excited. Then you leave number four, you finish, you go to number five, you can do that one. Number six, you can do that one. Number seven, you don't know the answer yet, but you're coming back. You go to number eight, you can do that one. But at that time, you have put a demand on all the things you studied, and they are beginning to come to the surface. By the time you're hitting question number 10, and suddenly you're relaxed, and now you're doing very well, when you go back to question number one, 
You remember Allah? What was wrong with this? With this question. In other words, you're putting a demand on what was deposited in you. You see, putting a demand is like going to the bank and, 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 and you know that yesterday you cashed, you, you deposited a banker's check of 500,000. Today, you are going to put a demand on your deposit. You don't go to the teller and say, teller, tell me. Do I have 500,000 shillings? The teller says, what is your account? Chiki, 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 chiki. Says, yeah, you actually have 500,000. Tell her, be merciful to me. I just need 50,000. The teller is wondering, what is wrong with you? He says, tell her, I have an emergency. And please, by the masses of this bank, please, can I see the bank manager? Would you do that? You don't do that. You know there is a deposit. You go with your check, you open that thing, you put a demand on your deposit. You miss that. I'm saying you put a demand on your deposit. You write and you write your name. Pay to Ambrose, Alan Ambassador Nyangao, international trader in Jesus' name. <laughs> no, you put the right name, okay? Otherwise, this thing is not going through. You put the date. You don't post-date this thing. You don't say, God, one of these days when you are in your good moods, please answer my prayer. That particular day. And you write it with confidence. Then you sign it. You know, then you cross-sign it. Then you send it in and you wait relaxed. You have put a demand on your deposit. But let's say, for example, there is nothing in your account. Can you put a demand on it? Let me tell you this. In your heavenly account, there is a deposit. There is a promise. You can put a demand. You can put a demand on God. And that is why this man came and said, I'm going to put a demand on, my, on, on the friendship I have. And when, when he pushed and pushed and pushed, the friend showed up and said, you can have as much as you, as you need. So this month, as we pray, don't, don't, don't come to God and beg. First of all, know what God has promised. We are praying for the nations. The Bible says in Psalms 2 verse 8, Ask me for the nations, and I'll give them to you as what? As an inheritance. Can you pray for the salvation of your family members? Yes, because God has already put a deposit for their salvation. And you can be able to say, Lord... Jesus died for my mom, he died for my father, he died for all of us, and dear Lord, I pray that in Jesus' name, salvation will come into this house. You're putting what? A demand. Are you understanding that statement? Put a demand. You're not arrogant, you're just telling God, God, I know this is what is mine, and you're asking. And so, let me finish that verse, because I was in the middle of this verse. Let me finish it. So, I said to you, ask and keep on asking, and it shall be given you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you shall find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door shall be open to you. Look at verse 10. For everyone who asks and keeps on asking, does what? Receives. And he who seeks and keeps on seeking, finds. And to him who knocks and keeps on knocking, the door shall be open. Look at verse 11. What father among you, if his son asks for a loaf of bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? God is not going to shortchange you. If you then, evil as you are, know how to give good gifts, gifts that are to the advantage to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and continue to ask him? Hallelujah. Put a demand. Maybe you've been asking for a, for a job for a long time. Don't stop. Your miracle is just around the corner. Hallelujah. 
Keep standing. Keep walking. Keep believing. And that's why I want to go to the third part as I summarize my message for the day. And I want to say this, there's a provision. Amen? There's a provision. You're putting a demand on the friendship that you have with God. And God is saying, there's a provision. And I'm not going to repeat that. We, do, we read those verses, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 to 6. That's your provision. God has blessed you in the city. He has blessed you in the countryside. He has blessed you when you come in. <coughs> blessed you when you go out. He has blessed the work of your hands. The heavens are open for you. There is provision. There is all that you need. God will provide. Hallelujah. There is provision. That's why I was telling you about the book of John. The wedding of Cana. There was provision. For Nicodemus' spiritual uh, questions, there was, an, uh, there was provision. For the woman from Samaria, there was provision. For the man who had been unwell for 38 years, there was provision. Hallelujah. For the blind man, there was provision. For the woman who needed justice, there was provision. For those that had lost their beloved one, there was provision. In Christ, there is provision. The Lord is your blessing. And I don't know what you need today. As I'll be praying in a, sh in a short moment, please put a demand and just tell God, God, I know what I need you have. Hallelujah. What I need you, you have. And all I want to say, number one, is to say thank you and to position myself under the waterfall of your blessings so that I will experience an overflow. Amen. Number four, when God answers you, the response is what? Is praise. The response is praise. The Lord will fulfill that which concerns you. That praise is illustrated in Psalms 126, which I want to read in the Amplified Version. Psalms 126. I'm reading it in the Amplified Version. This is what the Bible says. When the Lord brought back the captives who returned to Zion, we were like those who dream. <clears throat> it seemed what? So unreal. Let me say this. This week, may God come to you in such a way that it will be so unreal. Hallelujah. Blow your mind. Blow your mind. Have you ever asked somebody and said, I, I just need 10K? 10K. And for you, you even don't believe they'll give you 10K. If they can give you at most, they'll give you 7K. <clears throat> but the guy turns around and gives you 50K. It will be unreal. You start saying, I just asked for 10K. The guy says, keep change. <laughs> just for me. That's the time you, you start saying, I should have asked for 20K. <clears throat> Hallelujah. By the way, that's what happened to us one time when we were putting up this roof, this, this roof up here. And um, we had, we had, we had changad. Changa is a Hebrew word that means that we just, we had given a lot. Until we could give no more. And the building committee sat and started asking themselves, what, what, what can we do? Where can we get money? And we only needed at that time, which was around in the year 1999, we needed 2 million Kenya shillings. And it seemed too much. We could not get it anywhere. In the conversation, somebody said, by the way, there's a time we had asked the former president, Daniel Arapmoy, to come for a fundraiser. He didn't come. Now, somebody needs to go to ask him for the money he should have come with. We need it now. Hello? Now we need it. Somebody says, myself, that's a bright idea. Now who will go? <laughs> Somebody thought, thought, said, ah, but we have a friend of ours. Uh, Mr. Kagudi, who used to be the former PC quite some time ago. And of course now he's handling issues of Nyumbakumi. Hello? So we said, Mr. Kagudi, somebody knows Mr. Kagudi, go ask him. And when he talks to the president, let him ask for the two million Kenya shillings. So Mr. Kagudi asked that person, how much do you want me to ask the president? He said, we need two million. Kagudi said, fine. So when he had an opportunity to sit with the president, 
he asked and said, the president, by the way, there's people from Parkland Baptist Church, they want to put up the roof. Uh, they, they just need two million Kenya shillings as to complete that job. You know, you really have blessed them for so many years. They just want two million Kenya shillings for them to complete this thing. The president, without thinking, called one of his guys. They brought his check. He pulled out his green pen, and he just wrote to Parkland Baptist Church, two million Kenya shillings. He cut it, gave it to Mr. Kagudi. He said, give it to them. Mr. Kagudi came and gave it to us. We said, did you struggle? He said, no. <laughs> I just asked him. And he just wrote, and here it is. He said, he just gave you. He says, yes, one, what did you want? <laughs> you know, for us, we knew that to get two million, you have to struggle. And it came just like that. At that time, I said, we were so foolish. We should have asked for five million. How could we have asked for two million? How? If it came so easily like that, what made us just ask for two million? We got the two million, it was deposited, we put up that roof. Somebody better give God a big hand. <clears throat> One time Jesus said, some people said, you cannot forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, yes, it's true. But to show you that I can forgive sins and heal this man, and the two of them are as easy for me. He looked at that man, he said, stand up, pick up your bed and go home. And the guy left, which was telling them, if he can do that, he can also forgive sins. Let me tell you this, for Jesus, it is just that easy. May it be unreal for you this week. Then our mouths, let me finish this verse. Then our mouths, then our mouths filled with laughter. You know that kind of laughter that, that comes, that is overwhelming you. And our tongues with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. That's what they were saying. But now we ourselves are saying, the Lord has done great things for us. And we are what? We are glad. Turn to freedom, our captivity, and restore our fortunes. O oh Lord, as the streams in the south are restored by the torrents, they who sow in tears shall reap in joy and singing. He who goes forth bearing seed and weeping at needing his precious supply of grain for sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. This is your portion. I'm saying this is your portion. I'm saying this is your portion. Come on, come on. I'm saying this is your portion. Take it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, stand on your feet. And as you stand on your feet, tell your neighbor, I'm beginning to laugh inside. Hallelujah. I'm beginning to laugh inside. Uh, tell your neighbor, there, there's a calafta boiling inside me. <laughs> Hallelujah. The promise, the prayer, the third one, the provision, and the praise. How many of you would like to laugh this week? I'm, I'm included. And especially if your team wins. <laughs> Let me tell you this. May you experience overflow. Amen. May God blow your mind. <clears throat> you know, sometimes we come to church, we are so stressed by so many things. And we look forward for a Sunday where we can get a word. Guess what? You have a word. Amen. Take it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go out of this church today and say, I have an inheritance. God has already promised me. And I have a prayer. I'm going to put a demand on my friendship with God. I'm going to put a demand. I'm going to ask shamelessly. Hallelujah. Because of my friend. And you're not asking for yourself. He's asking to, from a friend so that he can provide for another friend. It is not selfish prayer. So when we're praying for the nations, we're not being selfish. We're praying for Uganda and Tanzania. 
We are praying for Ghana. We are praying for Egypt. We are praying for these nations so that as they are blessed, we shall be blessed. We are praying for Israel. Hallelujah. We are praying. We are putting a demand. So, look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, you better put a demand this week. In Jesus' name. Laughter will come to you, I'm telling you. God's provision is coming your way. In Jesus' name. I'm seeing laughter already in your heart. I can see laughter in your heart today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For some of you specifically, somebody tomorrow, Monday at noon, you'll have a lot of laughter. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let me tell you this. Whatever you need, Jesus has it. Salvation, Jesus has it. Peace, Jesus has it. Joy, Jesus has it. Breakthrough, Jesus has it. It is Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his garment. And his blood has made me whole. Father, as we are standing, we just want to say thank you. Lord, I sense a breakthrough in my spirit. Somebody has just experienced an overflow. Somebody is pressing beyond just believing. They are now beginning to laugh. They are beginning to go beyond that boundary. Lord, because they are putting a demand on your promise, a deposit has been made. Christ, you put a deposit for them. You said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it for you. Why don't you take a moment, just begin to talk to God. The worship team, I know you can play something at the back, the background. But I'm giving you a chance to put a demand on God. Don't struggle. Just tell God, I know you have what I need. Just, just put a demand. Talk, talk to God. Worship team, just... You get that music? In my soul. Even those listening to us For on radio. Talk to God. Put a demand. Put a demand on his love for you. He's your friend. He's your friend. One more time. Just keep praying. That's right, it's Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus. It's Jesus in my soul. It is Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his garment and his blood. Now let's join them now. Sing it one more time. Oh, it's Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. That's right. Yes, it is Jesus. It is Jesus in my soul. As we prepare to pray, <clears throat> you know, sometimes when you put a demand on God, on his friendship, sometimes you do it by a physical sign. When Jesus put mud in this man who was blind, he said, go wash. He put a demand on that promise, go wash. So look at me just briefly, because I know you're putting a demand on God on something. And sometimes you don't have to do much, you don't have to struggle. Sometimes you just have to take a step and say, God, I'm putting a demand in this area of my life. And today as we close this service, I want you to just do something. 
Maybe it is salvation. Maybe it is uh, healing, a provision. Um, I know we are many of us. But if you're just there and you're saying, God, I just want to show you that I'm serious. I'd like you to come up here. Just come. Then I'll pray. Because God knows your specifics. You come. One more time, just sing it one more time. Oh, it is Jesus. Yes, it is Jesus. It's Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the to pray. I know some of you just came. You left your belongings wherever they are. But I hope, I believe they are safe. I didn't know you would come, all of you. Hello. (laughs) Then you are serious like this. You are seriously putting a demand. I want to believe with you. For those upstairs, I want to believe with you. I'm talking to those in the pavilion. I, I believe you took a step and just moved forward. Those watching us online, this is just us saying, God, we're putting a demand on, your, on our friendship. You're our father. Reach out to us. So whatever it is, I believe that God will come through for you. So just lift up your hands as I pray. Father, hear your people. Just by that statement of stepping forward, they are putting a demand on your fatherhood. They are sons and daughters of God. Lord, like we have said today, there is a promise. We are making a prayer. The provision will come. And our praise will fill our hearts. Father, I don't have to pray for long because I know just by these ones stepping forward today, by them lifting up their hands today, They are saying, God, locate me. Locate me. Lord, there are those in the pavilion. Locate me. There are those online. Locate me. This is the month of July. This is the seventh month. This is the month of your completion. Father, in the name of Jesus, I stand before your people. And I stand before you. And I say, Lord God, hear them. Reach out to them. Touch them. Now, Holy Spirit, why don't you come upon your people? And if you're here, just open your mouth and begin to thank God. Begin to tell God, thank you that you have had me. <clears throat> thank you that you have located me. Thank you, Lord, that you're making a way where there seems to be no way. Thank you, Lord, that that healing is coming. Thank you, Lord, that that provision is coming. Thank you, Lord, that that loved one is saved. Thank you for that deliverance. Thank you for that open door. Thank you, Lord. My demand on you is because you have provided. You have more than enough. Lord, I reach out for the much more. How much more will the Father give to those who put a demand on him? How much more? How much more? How much more? Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Somebody is here because of salvation. Lord, save them in the name of Jesus. Somebody has come because of healing. Heal them in the name of Jesus. Somebody has come here because there's a need of supply. Supply now 
in the name of Jesus. Whatever the need is, Lord, come through. Come through right now. Come through right now. How much more? How much more? How much more? I want to tell you this. The much more is coming your way. The much more is coming your way. Somebody better say, I receive it. I take it. It is my portion. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. Now, if you believe that, why don't you give God a big hand and tell him, thank you. Tell him, thank you. Thank you. Now, reach out your hand up like this. Catch. Receive. Lift it up. Catch. Receive. Lift it up. Take it. Receive it. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. <laughs> nothing the devil can do about it. Amen. I want to release you now. Are you glad you came? Let me tell you this. Laughter is starting somewhere in somebody's heart today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yeah, there's laughter coming your way. Laughter coming your way. In Jesus' name. I'm telling you, start practicing. Can you start laughing a bit? And just tell God, it is here in Jesus' name. I love you in Jesus' name. I appreciate all of you in Jesus' name. May the Lord enlarge your territory. May the Lord release his favor in your life. Bigger than you can imagine. Now lift up your hands as I bless you. Because from here you'll be released. Even those in the pavilion, just lift up your hands. In the mighty name that is above every name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the countryside. You're blessed when you come in. You're blessed when you go out. This is your moment of overflow. Your doors are open. Your Monday is blessed. Your Tuesday is blessed. Your Wednesday is blessed. Your Thursday is blessed. Your Friday is blessed. Your Saturday is blessed. Sunday is testimony time. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let me say this. May your testimony start this afternoon. May your testimony start this afternoon. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Shalom upon you. Amen. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, surely goodness, surely goodness. And, mercy and mercy shall follow you. Shall follow you. I mean you. I mean you. Yani, you. yani you. All the days of your life. Of your life. And, you, and you, beyond a shadow of doubt, shadow of doubt. You, shall dwell you shall dwell in God's house, in God's, house. In God's, favor. In God's favor, in God's security. In God's security. In God's supply. In, in Jesus' name. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. In Jesus' name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Shalom. Have a great week. Testimony time. In Jesus' name. It's Jesus in my soul. Oh, I have touched the hem of his garment, and his blood has made me Yes, it is Jesus. It is Jesus in my soul. For I have touched the hem of his garment.